<laughs> Happy Sunday, August. What is this? The 29th of August. And this is the 23rd, 4th. <laughs> I'm losing count. Um, edition of Cow Care Office Hours, a joint friendship between um, Healthcare for All Los Angeles and PNHP. Um, we are here to talk about a lovely guaranteed health care for all bill that is currently um, going here in California. And this bill could revolutionize health care for California and for the rest of the country um, if we can get it passed. So what are we here for? We are here to talk to you and to answer your questions and to help empower you to go into your communities to talk about this bill, make people aware of it, um, feel empowered to go talk to your assembly people about it. That is what we're here to do and to just create a really good space to talk about health care. Overall, um, we have people here from all different backgrounds, including nurses and physicians. Um, you know, we have people who are respiratory therapists, physical therapists, um, a lot of different healthcare uh, industries all coming together behind this bill, just to let you know that this isn't just the nurses, this isn't just the doctors, this is the entire spectrum of healthcare coming because we know that this is the way forward for us. All righty. Um, so I am going to get started with what is CalCare? Um, and this is something I love to do, uh, and which is explaining the seven basic principles of CalCare, which um, I always find something funny to say, but we'll see how well my brain is functioning today. Um, so can someone give me a thumbs up? You can see my screen. Woo -woo. All right. CalCare is the California Guaranteed Health Care for All Act, like I said. Um, and once again, I have to give a shout out to CNA for this lovely um, one pager that explains the 60 something page bill in a one page uh, handout, which is great because we all know we have very short attention spans. Um, so California Guaranteed Health Care for All is the solution to our broken health care system. It is very broken. Um, it guarantees health care as a human right in the state of California by providing comprehensive 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 we're not just saying oh basic needs like you can go see your primary care doctor once a year no we're providing comprehensive high quality another emphasis on high quality just because it's guaranteed health care for all no matter what you look like act like say who you are religion no matter all it's high quality health care we're going to bring equity into this health care system um and so, uh, if, so it is um, just like Medicare for all nationally, but we're going to do it here for California um, first because, well, so goes California, so goes the nation. So we're providing universal coverage, everybody in, nobody out. And I mean, everybody, every body, you're a body, you're part of every. If you're in California, you're here, you're part of everybody. And we're saying nobody out. So if you do not have a body, if you are a sentient like energy being, I'm sorry, you might not get cow care, but that's okay because you're probably far ahead of us anyway. Um, so we're saying regardless of race, sex, gender, country of origin, disability status, immigration status, your marital status, your age, your income, you're going to get the care that you need regardless of your ability to pay. I don't know whose genius idea this was way back before Gina was born, but um, putting health care tied to payment, your ability to pay was unethical from the beginning. It was unethical, but somebody had a brilliant idea and a lot of people ran with it. And here we are today. So a single public program, a single payer publicly funded through progressive taxation. I have to emphasize this because I said the word taxation and this has been a hot topic, especially right now in California. We've got this recall thingamajig, waste of time in my life going on right now. And what the right side is saying, the, you know, the right wing Republicans is taxes, 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 bad, bad, bad. Well, guess what? Taxes are used to pay for services that are supposed to be better to help better the all citizens of this state. And so that is what CalCare will do. It is supposed to 
be funded through progressive taxation. Progressive taxation means the little guys don't get nickeled and dimed, um, but the big guys, the ones who are making billions and billions of dollars, despite it being a world global pandemic, well, they may have to pay taxes a little bit more than what we have to pay. I think that's pretty fair. You know, their mortgages, if they even have mortgages, will still be paid if they had to pay a little bit higher taxes. Um, whereas if the little guy gets taxed like that, well, you know, um, they may not make their mortgage. So progressive taxation means the more you make, guess what? The more you might have to pay, but it's not saying anything out of reason. So, you know, just covering that right now. Um, this is going to help us cover the necessary care in California. It's going to eliminate billions in bloat and waste. So a single payer system eliminates billions in bloat and waste and saves people thousands on their health care costs. Um, just because there are plans out there that they say are for low income or lower income, they call them affordable care, uh, you know, programs. Um, they nickel and dime and they do not provide the care that they need. So you might only have to pay $50 a month, but you've got a $6,500 deductible. Your co-pays are through the roof. So you really still can't afford the care. It's just that your monthly premium is low, but everything else is unaffordable. And that is the scam. Creating a single, a single payer system basically eliminates all of that. And then you get full comprehensive benefits, including your medical, dental, vision, hearing, mental health, prescription drugs, long-term care, and more. Um, you know, long-term care is something that's not even covered under Medicare right now. Um, to get long-term care, you have to qualify for Medi-Cal, which some of our seniors don't because they've worked, they've got pensions, and the Medi-Cal income limits are just really too low to qualify. So... Um, that's the only way you can really pay for long-term care unless you have some type of buy-up plan or you can pay out of pocket for it. Um, but all the decisions about your care will be between you and your doctors and nurses, not the insurance companies. I say this a lot. Insurance companies do not provide care, okay? They regulate it. They, they squeeze it, but they do not provide it, okay? That your care is provided by doctors, nurses, and the people within the hospital or the, the offices that take care of you. Um, that is not the insurance company. So I don't want you to tie the care that you receive, that, that if you have a great primary care doctor, you love him, your primary care doctor is not your insurance company, okay? So separate that. Those two are do two different things. It just happens to be that that primary care doctor that you love so much happens to be in the network of your insurance company, and you're lucky for that one. Anyway, you're going to have the freedom to choose your care provider, going into what I was just saying about that primary care doctor. Um, if the other end of the situation where you didn't like your primary care doctor, if you wanted to change your primary care doctor, depending on what insurance you have, what network you had, you might have to go through a little bit of work to get that done. Um, under CalCare, there will be no more in-network or out-of-network. You will have the freedom to choose any doctor or hospital you like. So if you want to go to um, a, a new provider because you don't have you to feel like your primary care doctor's not doing the right thing or you just don't have a good relationship and you want to choose another one, you should be able to do that. And with CalCare, you'll be able to call that new doctor's office. Maybe you look them up. Maybe you got recommended by a friend or family member. You call them up and you say, hey, um, can, does this doctor take new patients? Can I schedule an appointment? I have CalCare. They're going to be like, okay, yeah, great. The doctor can see you next week. Come on in at this time. You come on in. You give them your CalCare card. They give you the new patient forms. And that is that. Done. And that goes into my next point, free at the point of service. I, you see, I didn't mention the word copay. Um, I didn't say you paid anything because with CalCare, there are no more copays, premiums, or deductibles. You arrive at the doctor's office, like I just said, you show them your CalCare card. You might have to fill out those patient information forms. Those aren't going away just with CalCare. You still have to fill out patient information. Um, and then you get the care you need. You have a seat. You go back to the doctor's office. That's it. Done. <laughs> Um, it's really that simple. So then you want to know like, well, what happens to the people in the insurance industry? The insurance, in, the insurance industry does uh, employ several thousand people um, here in California. So this bill is so comprehensive that it includes a just transition. Well, what's that? It is funding and programs to protect and support displaced workers in the insurance industry. Um, that is something that doesn't get included into a lot of bills. So this bill is that comprehensive. They are very cognizant that this is going to revolutionize um, the healthcare system and this will affect the insurance industry. The workers of that insurance industry do not have to suffer because of their bad leadership.
You know, the workers are not the ones who made these bad decisions to make this healthcare system as ugly as it is. That is not, that was not their decision. They're employed, they have bills to pay, they have, you know, they have to take care of their families. So they should not be dragged when we pass this bill. So we're going to look out for them too. Um, and then lastly, patient care based on patient need. No more financial incentives to avoid providing necessary care. Well, Gina, isn't that illegal? Yeah, it is illegal, but there are always a loophole to something. So when we say avoid providing necessary care, it doesn't mean that necessarily the insurance industry will downright say, no, we're not going to do it but they're gonna send you through the ringer to get it done. And that is somewhat of an avoidance because depending on what it is and depending on how driven you are to get it done, you may never follow through with it. They send you through so many loops and like, um, Dr. Bill has the photo of this big spaghetti bowl of payment. Um, they send you through the spaghetti bowl and there's really no one there um, to help you navigate it too much. Sometimes you're lucky to have somebody like myself, what I do, just case management, help you navigate some of the spaghetti bowl, but even I can only go so far. So the spaghetti bowl is part of, of the avoiding providing necessary care um, because they send you through that spaghetti bowl. And most of the time you might not make it back through. Um, and so that is the avoid of providing that necessary care because it is expensive. And thank you, Dr. Bill, for the background of the spaghetti bowl um, or the toddler scribbles. I don't know, it does look like a toddler scribble all over it, but it is true. Um, and so then you're gonna, you know, we're gonna include the value-based payment model for providers. So that is CalCare in a very long-winded, hopefully somewhat entertaining way. Boop, yay. All right, let me pull up chat here. So, yeah, I don't know. There's um, Sean always likes to take a uh, point on there and like tell like a personal story. So oh, I don't know. He brought that... that up because actually I did have a, you know, last week, um, man, last week was a, it was a day. Uh, I wasn't here because I was stand stranded on the side of a road <laughs> because of my, the mechanics bad, um, bad work basically. But long story short, I'm good and everything's well with that. Uh, but what the story I wanted to tell last week was something I had worked on this past week um, or that week um, for a patient, which is someone who came in and found out that they have a pretty aggressive cancer and they do not have insurance and um, they need to be treated and, and the docs and everybody want to treat her and they want her to start treatment right away but how can you start treatment, chemotherapy, aggressive chemotherapy at that, um, or, or excuse me, aggressive radiation therapy, um, if you don't have insurance? So the, now the mission was to try to hurry up and get this, this patient, you know, um, emergency Medi-Cal so that we can get started. And like I said, going back to what I do as case management, this is part of what I do as clinical case management is to start trying to put all those together. And it requires me to really, you know, put this person kind of bump them around to the top of the list to try and get their, you know, the intention of the financial counseling team. Do they even qualify? Are they making money? No, because, you know, they're recently laid out, they lost their employer, employer sponsored insurance. They lost it due to layoffs. Um, and so now this person finding out they have this devastating cancer diagnosis, lost your employer sponsored insurance. Um, and now you have to, you know, you have to figure out you're getting told that you need to start treatment right away and costs, you know, you can't even think of the cost. You can't even, you know, you're not even, it's not even clicking in your brain that you don't have the insurance to cover it. And, but then when it does, and, you know, then I have to get on the phone and have their family break down to me you know, this person was not old. This person wasn't someone I would just say, well, maybe go on hospice. You know, this was someone who was a mother, um, who had a family, who has a family, who has to take care of the family, have young children and to have, you know, their teenage daughter call me and break down telling me, I don't want to lose my mom. Well, hell, I, I don't want you to lose your mom either. So I got to make something happen. And Thankfully, we were able to get this person some type of Medi-Cal coverage, but it's only 30 days. And I don't know what's going to happen after that. I, you know, like, I don't know what happens. I hope it's a happy ending every time, but I know it's not. And that is what happens. CalCare would have eliminated all of that. 
there would not have been that worry. I would have not got that conversation with this teenager, mind you, um, about them not being able to get the chemotherapy and the radiation therapy they need because they don't have insurance and they can't afford it. A teenager telling me that they can't afford, they're barely making their rent. How can they afford to pay this? That is not something. So you see how much the healthcare system, this bad healthcare system, you see how much this causes trauma to everybody involved. A teenager should not be having to worry about their finances. We can, we're barely can afford to pay our rent. How are we going to pay for this? Her words, not mine. And that Jen, is I, I see Dr. Bill's hand is up, but yep. I really like the point that you make. Um, and as always, well, first of all, let me just back up. I see we have some new people on the Zoom. Just want to say at any time, if you guys have any questions, just go ahead and raise your hand. And for those of you joining us on Facebook, please put your questions in the Facebook comments and Paul Newman. Um, if you want to wave Paul, he will um, share your questions. So, um, but I really, um, you know, thanks for sharing that story, Gina. And I, I like when you talk about, you know, this is traumatizing everybody. It's not just the patient that's traumatized. I mean, it's almost like alcoholism. It's a family disease where everybody is getting hurt and probably generational. Um, when, when grandma and grandpa worked hard to buy that house that they were going to then pass down as part of generational wealth, if they go on, you know, Medi-Cal, they are pro might lose that house. So it's just like, so everybody's affected. And then I just want to point out as are you, Gina, as are you, Nancy is on here. She's a doctor as are you, Dr. Bill, as are the nurses. And, I, you know, hanging around you guys, I hear your stories of trauma as well. I just watched a YouTube video of a nurse who was really traumatized after a COVID shift today. Um, and so it's just, I mean, the trauma from this cruel healthcare system, everybody except the C-suite and the insurance companies and the pharmaceutical companies and the medical supply companies is being hurt and traumatized by this. But anyway, I see Dr. Bill has his hand raised, so. Go ahead, Dr. Bill, with the spaghetti bowl in the background. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, but I just wanna, uh, first of all, agree with Erica that it is class warfare and it's the corporate class against the rest of us, the working class, professionals of all kinds, you know, whether they're nurses, doctors, teachers, lawyers, you know, uh, people who work, actually work for a living um, as opposed to the corporate class who don't, you know, corporate CEOs don't buy the products that they sell generally. And that's, that's even true of, um, of those who run um, health insurance companies. They don't own health insurance. Uh, it's not even paid for by the company like a perquisite. It's not on their corporate credit card. They have a foundation that pays for it all, for, the, for all of their medical treatment. So, I mean, most of us don't have any idea what that even means. I remember a friend of mine who happens to be in that corporate class once told me, like an old college friend, he said, he had trouble getting his his daughter on a on a soccer team because they required that she have health insurance. And he's like, I don't have to buy health insurance <laughs> for my daughter, you know, but they wouldn't let her on the soccer team because you didn't have health insurance. I'm like, oh, I so can't relate to you. <laughs> um, but um, but I did want to say that that this mess that uh, Gina was talking about is creating. Um, and an inequity, uh, you know, a, a social injustice. Um, this is real. This is not just like thrown up there a bunch of squiggles and boxes. Every one of these boxes and lines are actually connected, actually exists. This was written, it was, uh, the diagram was made by a social scientist, a PhD friend of ours named Henry Broska, 
who studied who has studied healthcare systems. He did this because he came from the Canadian system, which is nice and orderly and neat. I'm gonna um, put up the diagram for Canada here and just notice notice the stark contrast. Okay, this is the way they pay for healthcare in Canada. Nice, orderly, neat, transparent. You know, you start here, you end up down here kind of thing. Okay, so that's what we're dealing with. It's not just inefficient, it's also an opportunity for fraud and abuse. That's where they hide all those surprise billings. That's where they charge you for things based on what you're willing to pay, what your life is worth to you, not what it costs them to run those operations. That's called extortion. That's making you pay for something because you're afraid of the alternative. It's like the mafia saying, hey, that's a nice kid you got there. Be ashamed if something bad happened to him and you didn't buy our overpriced product. Um, but what it amounts to is, is dollars and cents in economics. And when we say that this system will cost less, that's not a pipe dream. That's not ponies. You know, this is, this is I always say it's not, it's not pie in the sky. It's Marie Callender's pie. It's a pie you bought at the pie shop. And when you got it home, you're missing a third of your pie is stolen from you. A third of every healthcare dollar is stolen from you. And you're, you just get the two thirds to deal with your healthcare problem, even though you paid for a whole pie. And that results in, you know, when we get to a single payer system like AB 1400, saving incredible amounts of money, $40 billion a year for California, for our population of 40 million people, it's like we'll save $40 billion per year. Now, what can you do? What can the state of California do with $40 billion? Well, what comes to mind, to my mind, is housing the unhoused, is, is investing in renewable energy, is a whole lot of infrastructure, including you know, high-speed rail. I mean, a whole lot of things that we can do with $40 billion per year in savings. And then also it saves lives. Um, it will save, and this again, this is well-established healthcare economic fact. It will save a, mil, a, a thousand lives for every million uninsured. Now, even after the Affordable Care Act, when we rolled out the ACA in California, right? We expanded Medicaid and rolled out the Affordable Care Act with exchanges, state exchanges. We did a good job of that compared to you know, some of those, those backward state, unvaccinated states, right? The red states. We, we still have at least 10% of the population uninsured in California. That means at least 4 million people uninsured. That's 4,000 lives per year. Um, every million people, we can save 1,000 lives per year just simply by having insured. Now, that doesn't include the underinsured, you know, where you can't afford the high deductible plan that you sign up for and you end up bankrupt. Or like you said, you end up losing your home because you had to go into a skilled nursing facility and then go bankrupt so that you could get on Medi-Cal. All of that, you know, needs to be undone too. But let's just say, let's give that 4 million people insurance. Guess what? That saves 4,000 lives. 4,000 people from having to die per year. And if you look at COVID, and that's the ultimate irony and what ought to be driving people the hardest right now, and, um, and uh, Gina in her brilliance mentioned this too, that having insurance tied to your employment ought to be enough to rile people up. But when you look at those numbers, you know, and, and I put those in the chat, you know, we have lost 65,000 plus people to COVID in California, right? So about 650,000 nationwide, 65,000 people in California, a full 40% of those people who have died from COVID would have been saved if we had a single payer universal health care system. That means 26,000 people 
who would still be alive today who did not have to die. So if you know anyone in California who died from COVID, there's a good chance they'd be alive today if we had already passed and put into place AB 1400. And that should be what drives everybody, including all of those you know, corporate um, uh, driven uh, politicians in Sacramento who are to get off their asses and go ahead and, and uh, move uh, AB 1400 to the legislature. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Bill. That, that was exactly, I mean, amazing uh, point to be made right there. I mean, right there alone should have been a reason why the entire assembly should just be like, yes, but we know that doesn't work that way. Anyway, um, well, I wanna go on, uh, Sylvester, I see you have your hand up, welcome. Hey, uh, good evening now, yeah, it's evening now. Uh, one, yeah, my name is Sylvester. Uh, I live in Cerritos. Uh, thank you all for providing this educational space in the office hours. It's been a minute since I've been in school. So uh, it's kind of weird to come back to office hours, but I'm glad that you all are providing that space where people can learn and educate more uh, about, you know, this bill and, you know, how they can support, you know, the, you know, the work that you all have been doing here. Um, and the question, the question that I had is when you are explaining or you're having conversations around this, um, if this is something, a talking point that you use to people is that you don't actually, you don't need healthcare insurance to get healthcare. You, you find that being like an effective thing, separating the two. Uh, Cause I know a lot of people, they associate healthcare insurance with the, with the care that they receive, but that, you know, if you, kind of you know, explain in a way where that's like a middle person that you don't need um, in this whole thing. Well, exactly. So that's one thing I want to separate. That's why I say insurance companies do not provide health care. They regulate it. They are kind of like a faucet. They will turn the faucet, they can open the faucet or they can tighten that faucet and whatever's coming out is the care that you receive. So people do tie that. They think that they, you know, for example, we can use Kaiser, Anthem, whichever one you choose. But everyone has said, well, I have good insurance. I have great doctors. Okay, yeah, you have great doctors, but you also have to pay the co-pays to see those doctors every time you see them. You have to pay the payments for the medications that they prescribe. You have to pay the deductible if you haven't met it. You you get nickel and dime by your insurance company to see those doctors that you love. Now, what if that all that went away, but you still got to see those doctors? Hmm. So that's why I want to separate that out. It is not the insurance company that is the reason why those doctors are great. Now, granted, yes, the networks that those insurance companies have have built may also give you a certain level of healthcare, you know, like you may be able to go to a higher level healthcare center, you may be able to go to UCLA uh, medical centers where some insurances, unfortunately, UCLA is not in their network because mainly of cost. Um, it, but it still should not be, I don't want people to put that in their head that their insurance is the reason why they get the good care. It is because your insurance has just happened to negotiate that network. But if that network did not exist, you could still have that. If you had just a single payer system, you could still have that without that insurance company. But naysayers, people who do not agree with this will definitely argue this, that, well, look at, you know, for example, um, we can talk about the union conversation. Um, people who have union benefits have good, typically good networks. And because that's because their union had to spend so much time fighting for those networks, fighting for those benefits. And what I always like to bring up is that, well, what could your union fight for if they didn't have to fight for that? If they didn't have to spend so much time fighting for your insurance benefits, and I mean, what else could you, what else do you want? You know, what else could you have asked for your union rep? What else, there are other things that the employees need and their unions unfortunately have to spend a lot of time at that table talking about health benefits. And if we took the health benefits off that table because everyone was automatically covered anyway, 
then they could go fight like hell for something else that they need that the like you know that the nurses could need that the longshoremen need that the electricians need that the postal workers need you know there's other things and they should not have to spend so much time at the table just talking about health benefits so that's why I say about that. Sorry, that was long winded, but I do like to separate those two out because a lot of people, a lot of our average people out here who are just here trying to survive and I ain't mad at you for it. Um, I are just really, they still tie these two together. They're, they're married together because for generations, I mean, as long as I've been alive, yes, your insurance, the good, how good your insurance is means how good your doctors are. Um, that's what has been in my brain too, until I got into this type of work. Um, so thank you for that question. I really appreciate it, but I do think we need to start separating. We need to divorce the insurance companies from the providers. <laughs> um, Eric, I see you have your hand up or sorry. Um, actually I saw, uh, just one second, Eric, I want to go back to Randy's question in the chat. Or right. actually this is about, this is relates to Sylvester. Oh, sure. Go ahead. So, yeah. Um, Sylvester, I just want to say, um, Great point, and I like the way that you phrase that. Um, you don't need health insurance to have health care. In fact, health insurance is preventing you from getting the health care that you need. Um, all these other countries um, don't have health insurance, and their people have great health care. And remember, health insurance. Um, Dr. Bill, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but that didn't come around until like the 1960s with Nixon. Um, there wasn't health insurance before then. My mother um, had a life before I was born and she was married to another guy who wasn't my dad. But anyway, she, her first child at the time, she and her husband, she was an elementary school teacher working in public school, and her husband was an art teacher at the public school. And when um, my mom had her first child, um, they there they didn't there was no such thing as health insurance. They went to the hospital, they had the baby, they paid the hospital the bill. She said that they, you know, budgeted to pay for that. They didn't go out to dinner twice. So it was two nights out to dinner that, you know, they saved and they were able to pay for their hospital bill. And that was it. You know, today, people who have insurance just to pay um, the co-pays and, and the deduct deductibles, like Gina was saying, to have a baby is ridiculous. So I really like the way that you, um, that you, that point that you brought up and I really like the way that you phrased it. So um, I see you have your hand raised again. If it's a different point, let's come back to that because um, there's some other questions. Um, but if it's on the same point, go ahead. Okay, we'll come back um, around to that, but I just wanna go um, to Randy's question um, in the chat. Uh, do we know, this is kind of change, a little bit um, changing gears a little bit. Do we know what, it, uh, excuse me, what is the next commission or what is next with the commission? I'm sorry, even with glasses, I'm just bleh. Or uh, are we still waiting to the recall vote? Um, so I will answer half of that. And then Erica, I know you're following this commission way more. I've kind of put blinders on. Um, but uh, regarding the recall vote, yes, everybody is all hands on deck. And all the elected officials, all the Democratic Party bodies are currently solely focused on um, defeating this recall effort going on right now. So a lot of the conversations and organizing around other issues have been backburnered um, until after we get past the recall election. Unfortunately, makes me very angry because this whole recall thing is a, way, <laughs> a waste, but we have to defeat it because um, we know that unfortunately our best bet of getting cow care is going to come with uh, Gavin Newsom as governor and not Larry Elder or whoever the other 45 people are on that ballot. Um, Erica, I will let you answer that other half. <laughs> um. So yeah, thanks um, Randy Hicks for the question. Um, what is next with the commission? Don't worry about the commission. They're, they're not doing shit for AB 1400. In fact, 
Uh, it was my understanding, which I missed the last um, commission because what were what we were doing something? I can't remember what it was, Gina. Oh, we had the LA City Council vote at the same time. But um, the, the commissioners, there's only three who are pro single payer. So if you look at the math, Randy, the commission is stacked against single payer. So with the exception of Dr. Myra Rupa, um, Carmen Comstey, who actually wrote AB 1400, and Dr. Shao, who's on the East Coast. Um, so he's not, you know, as familiar with AB 1400, but um, he's pro single payer. That, you know, they're not even allowed to talk about AB 1400. So here you have this commission that was supposed to be for single payer. It's not, it's a diversion. It's, uh, it's pretty much opposition tactics. So we're not waiting for the commission. Nothing's happening at the commission. And um, I would say we're not even waiting for what's happening with the recall. We're educating people now on AB 1400. We have no time to waste. Um, there was a Cuban uh, music festival. We had people down there um, passing out information about cow care, canvassing down there. Um, Feel the Burn Dem, Dem Club um, right now is at um, Warner Center and they're giving out information about cow care. So we're not waiting for anything. We are out there educating folks on cow care. We're continuing with our office hours. Paul can drop the volunteer link in the Facebook chat. Um, you can volunteer with us. Um, so keep going, AB 1400 now. Make your um, appointments with your legislators to talk to them to get on board with CalCare. And Paul, if you want to drop the toolkit in the chat too, we're linked up to the nurses toolkit. Um, there's organizing going on um, right now. So, and with that, Dr. Bill, is this on this question? Is your hand for this question? All right, take it away. Oh, oh okay. Well, it's, uh, it's, it's, I, okay. I was just going to add to what um, Eric has said. I, I totally agree. This commission um, would appear to be uh, marginalizing itself into irrelevance, but um, but I, I do think that um, there is a chance uh, to, to salvage itself um, because what is happening with the commission is that they're meeting monthly and by the end of the year, they have promised to get a report to the governor. Now, uh, will they still be in existence if we have a different governor? Uh, who knows? Uh, and what will the governor do with it at the end of the year? Who knows? But the reason the bill was, um, you know, was, uh, was uh, suspended and created, turned into a two-year bill by the author, Ash Talra, was to get more support um, in, uh, among his fellow uh, assembly members to get it through the committee process once the new year starts, okay? And so there's a kind of ramped up session of the assembly starting, you know, at the first year. Now, if we have the same governor and the commission gets its report to the governor and the governor says at that point, OK, full speed ahead, I want everybody in the assembly to be on board with this bill. There is a chance that they can do that, um, you know, to get it actually through the assembly committee hearing process, get it voted on by February so it can go over to the Senate side and then get it heard so that then voted in the Senate uh, by the end of the year. Now, what does all that depend on? You and me. <laughs> Depends on all of us to make it known to our assembly members and our state senator because they, you know, there's a, a Senate co-authors of the bill too, right? So if we uh, put the pressure or not pressure, let's just say we tell our legislators that, that they have, you know, support from us to make this happen and get it through so it's voted on by next year if we still have the same governor um, and we can uh, apply pressure or that same message of support to the governor 
presuming he keeps his office, um, then the governor can apply that same kind of pressure on the legislature. Um, it's really for both those imperatives that we talked about, both the moral and fiscal imperative that they do this. And I do think because, uh, you know, where, where Erica and I might differ a little bit on this is that I do think that more and more of them are coming around to the way we've been looking at this even for decades, which is that, you know, we know that it will save money and save life. And, and that means that they, they need to be on our side, on the side of the people. Uh, and it's more and more resolutions are being passed. And, you know, hooray to uh, Healthcare for All Los Angeles and the people of LA who have helped pass that resolution with the uh, LA City Council this week uh, uh, in support of AB 1400. That was a big deal. So more and more pressure from down below is, is being applied. And that means that does put pressure on the commission and the commission could do its job to get its report through to the governor and then the governor could apply that kind of pressure to the legislature to actually make it happen. Exactly. And um, that this bill, AB 1400 is the people's bill. This is going to be a bottom up bill, not a top down. Um, thankfully, we have such a strong leader like Ash Kalra um, and, you know, leading on this. He is kind of he's a people's representative. He's definitely somebody who I've heard it from his lips saying that if I don't get reelected, I don't care, but I want this through and I can respect that. Um, Erica bears witness. She heard it, too. Um, but you know, I, this is going to be the people's bill. And this will be the sign of, do you represent the people or question mark? I'm not saying anything else on that. Sylvester, you have your hand up and then we'll go to Dylan, um, your question, uh, Dylan's question from Facebook. Uh, thank you again. And um, I'm gonna have a, a couple, I'm gonna ask one cause I want Dylan to go ahead and ask, ask his question, uh, but so somebody who is my assembly member is Christina Garcia, right? So she's, I've heard her say, oh, well, I support it, but how are you gonna pay for it? That was like her thing. And I, and I understand, like, I, I know, you're grabbing your head, Erica, I see you. It's frustrating when people say things like that. Um, but when, you know, when you're engaging in, in this type of discussion, you also wanna understand the perspectives and the different, you know, attacks that other people will have against you because that's going to be a part of the conversation so when someone says something like oh well how are we going to pay for it then what is the retort to counter that Ooh, um it depends on who it is number one um nancy i know you i know it. go ahead because nancy has a simple way of saying it go ahead nancy <laughs> it's cheaper period <laughs> Uh, that is Nancy. It is true. I mean, but you know, that is literally the truth. And it is very simple. It is a good narrative to run. Um, but if you are talking to, you know, assembly member uh, Garcia, um, then, you know, saying it's cheaper, you know, that would be a good start off. But you know, she's going to want to know the what and the why. And the first thing, now having talked to them and really gotten into their heads um, a little bit, my comeback is that, you know, for all the ones who are saying, how are we going to pay for it? My thing is, are you willing to work with me on building that out? Because what they're asking for right now is something that none of them will ever ask for. If I come with a bill about military, whatever, National Guard, this, anything else, they will not ask you, well, how are we going to pay for it? They want the, what they're doing is copping out and they want you to provide basically a ledger because even if we say, well, we're going to get the waivers for this, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, which is written out in the bill on how that we're going to do it. Truthfully, it is. Um, that's not good enough for them on this on this particular topic. It is not good enough. They really want to see dollar for dollar spent. And I don't understand why, because they don't ask for that for any other bill. So now as a representative of the people, my question, it's kind of like answering a question with a question, but I want to know before you waste precious oxygen, because COVID has made us realize how precious oxygen is, are you willing to work with me to pay for this? Are you willing to help build this out to pay for it? Because the answer is there if you're willing to work with it. I can't, I'm not in the assembly. As much as many, some, several people here have wanted me in that place, I'm not in that place. 
But are those people in that place, like for example, Christina Garcia, are you willing to work with me to build this out? And I promise you, I will answer that question, but I need you to vote yes for me to get you that answer because without that yes vote, I technically can't give you that answer because co or COVID, Lord help me, because AB 1400 actually needs a yes vote for the board to be built, for the, um, the, uh, you know, the committee to be built so that they can get that answer. And I don't know if they know that or not, truthfully, but if they don't, then I really am asking, are you willing to do the work? And if you're not willing to do the work, go please sit down, go get another job and let somebody who is willing to do the work take that seat. Because I'm kind of getting really tired of these people who aren't willing to take, who do, can't do the work. Because it's like, well, what the hell am I paying you for? Because that's your representative. Those are your tax. She's your tax dollars. So at the end of the day, it's like, well, if you're not willing to put into the work for this, then you, at the, then what am I paying you for? You know what I mean? So I'm not giving you the direct answer that Christina's going to want because I don't truthfully can't have that answer she's looking for unless she votes yes and allows this to be built so it's in a sense it's a, it's a circle it's like the circle of life simba <laughs> but no um but yeah i after really kind of comprehending this bill this way it made perfect sense to me and that that is the cop-out strategy but i'm copying them back and saying you know what if you're willing to vote yes i'll answer your question but if you're not willing to vote yes and, and put in the work that's needed to get, get the answer to that question, then what, what are you doing? Um, so I just wanted to, that's basically, but there is, there is a way in AB 1400, it does kind of give you a little rough breakdown of how we pay for it. It is with obtaining waivers. It is with progressive taxation. And that's another thing that's gonna really make them scared. Um, but there is there, the structure basically is there on how we would obtain the payment for it. But the good thing is, because I know you probably, I don't know how many of you of these you've watched, but the good thing is too about AB 1400 is that if we cannot build sustainable funding, we will never start this. We are not going to start AB 1400, provide healthcare for everybody for six months and let it go belly up. If we can't show that we're going to fund this out and actually it be sustainable, then the, then the board can never say, yes, CalCare is ready. So, but the thing is, is that I need to be able to start the process. And if they are blocking us from starting the process, then I'll never be able to answer the question that they keep asking and that they're saying that they can't vote yes on because I can't answer the question, but I need them to say yes for me to answer that question. Hello, somebody. Anyway, <laughs> um, Erica, sorry, uh, Nancy, I saw you had your hand up and then um, I need to get to Dylan's question. And Erica, was this related to, okay. I, I just think, you know, understand that a good percentage of my week is spent trying to figure out what medicine insurance is going to reimburse for my patient. I spend so much time jumping through hoops trying to care for patients, and it's wasted, let alone all the people in offices that make up that 30% of the healthcare do dollar. And I think that's one number that needs to be kept out in front, that 30, 40% of insurance company healthcare dollars go to overhead. And I think that's the other part of a simple answer. Why is it cheaper? Because it's streamlined. And streamline is very important because just like you spend that much time, I'm spending that much time helping getting that answer for you uh, as case management. That is part of what I do is trying to figure out those prior authorizations and which medication is going to be more affordable and everything else. But I've got to spend 45 minutes on hold with the insurance company just to get hung up on to have to call the insurance company back while I'm eating my lunch because I can't take a right break because I have to stay on hold with the insurance company. So I can't actually go take a break because I still have other patients that I need to take care of. So yeah, streamlined yep. is very important for us. Um, Erica, you had your hand up. You're on mute, Erica. Sylvester, thanks so much for that question. And um, Gina answered it really well. Just a couple of things to keep in mind. Whenever you hear your assembly member or legislator ask that question, that's an opposition talking point. So just know right then and there, 
they are taking money from whoever and this is their opposition talking point. As Gina mentioned, there is no other bill that they ask how it's gonna be paid for. The train to wherever, Vegas, nobody asks how you're gonna pay for it. They don't ask how you're gonna pay for anything except when it comes to this. Why? Because um, on the federal level, the medical industrial complex is Nancy Pelosi's number one funder. It's where they get most of their money from. So it's an opposition talking point. Couple of things to keep in mind. Um, it's also, as Gina said, if they're asking you that question, they haven't read the bill. So right there, you got them there because this is a policy bill. The financing um, you know, piece is, is a separate bill. So that's why Gina is saying, well, there you can pass this bill and then we can have that conversation because there's no point in, in having that conversation unless you're gonna pass this bill. This bill is just policy. So let's see how serious you are, pass the bill, and then we can get to it. Exactly. Again, it's not a straightforward answer. I know what you would like, but um, as other people said, just things for you to keep in mind, California is the world's, the world's fifth largest GDP. Our GDP is much larger than that of Canada's and our population is about the same. They can afford it. We can afford it. And we not make, even mm -hmm. go ahead, Gina. No, I was just saying we and we make and we make the money. Uh, but you know, go ahead because I want to get to Dylan's question. It's been sitting for a long time. So I really um so I'll kind just of, wrap it up by saying it's not can we afford it? It's just how are we gonna pay for it? How are we, like Ron said once, Dr. Ron said, are we gonna like pay for the new car with cash? Are we gonna pay for the new car in payments? Are we gonna pay for the new car and splitting it up on credit cards? There's so many ways to pay for this. And in the end, it saves money and it saves lives. Had SB 562 passed in 2017, by the end of 2020, California would have saved $111 billion. So saves money, yeah. saves lives. That's how we're going to pay It's just cheaper. I mean, as Nancy says, it's cheaper. I mean, that needs to be on the shirt. AB 1400, it's cheaper. Uh, that's great messaging. Uh, Sylvester, we'll come back to your question here in a second. I just want to get to Dylan's uh, question from Facebook. Would underserved communities see an increase in available hospitals and healthcare in their areas as a result of AB 1400? Simply put, yes. Um, in AB 1400, that's why I call it a health equity bill, because it is bringing equity into these underserved communities by bringing that funding. Um, now, how I imagine it, because it's not, you know, exactly like I can't give you the entire play on how they're going to bring that in. They, it is written in there that, that they are going to, um, you know, provide, you know, resources for underserved and rural communities to build up their clinics and hospitals. Um, but when you are doing public health, you're doing what they, like a health risk assessment or analysis, and you're looking at these communities and with population health and social determinants of health being the new hot topics in healthcare right now, um, I, it is guaranteed to be looked at and then to guarantee to see that um, that these certain communities need resources. There are deserts around here and they are getting gobbled up during COVID across the country. Small community hospitals actually got gobbled up by bigger ones. And in it, what's even sucks, I saw an article in New York Times that like Barnaby Hospital in New York bought another community hospital uh, using PPP funds. You know, they use COVID funds to go buy a hospital. Now, shouldn't you have been buying PPE or something? Like, you know, like, isn't that what that was for? Uh, to pay, it was payroll protection and you bought a hospital. And so that's what I'm saying is that, you know, that has to stop. Like, and that is what's going on in the industry right now. 
is that they are using funds, they're coming and gobbling up these small community hospitals and slapping their name on it and somewhat repurposing them. Like and there was another hospital here in LA that just recently closed down during the pandemic bought by a bigger healthcare system. And it's not even gonna be used as a full hospital. It's gonna be used for services, which is not necessarily a bad thing. But if you were using that as a full functioning emergency room, hospital, surgeries, all that stuff, and you just, you shut it down and now it's only open for certain services. Now that becomes an issue. But yes, Dylan, AB 1400 does address the underserved rural community. Um, and overall, that is a focus in healthcare um, because they are now we're seeing, especially COVID has pulled the veil off of all of this, um, where it, we are seeing that in rural and underserved communities who don't have access to care, they are suffering the most. Um, and so, you know, with AB 1400, yes. Uh, Dr. Bill, you wanted to, you had wanted to add to that? Yes, just real briefly. So um, two things. Um, first of all, and I think COVID is the greatest example of this, uh, frankly, but um, um, CalCare, you know, is public health driven by public agencies. Okay, so right now we don't have, we don't really have a public healthcare system. It's driven by commercial interest, not public interest. And, um, and the two things that are built in to CalCare, into single payer bills generally, and specifically into uh, our bill in California, AB 1400, um, and they're directed by a public board um, are uh, what's called um, uh, 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 global budgeting, and then um, uh, investments in uh, capital expenditures. Okay, so global budgeting tells hospitals and large uh, clinical institutions um, how much money they have to operate on, say in a year's time, depending on what their needs are. So none of this is market driven, it's public needs driven, okay? That's what a global budget is. That's the public saying what it needs. So in underserved areas, it's global budgeting directed, not some um, corporate board, you know, uh, dictating uh, uh, determined by market share, okay? And the other thing is capital expenditure, which means where are we gonna build more hospitals? Where do we build more clinics? So, you know, if you're a big dog player like Kaiser, you know, does Kaiser get to build more clinics or hospital? Guess who's going to tell them? The CalCare board will tell them if they can build a new clinic or hospital. Um, and that, so that, those are two major differences that will direct resources to where they're needed. And that's especially important in both what we call healthcare deserts. In California, of course, we have both inner city and rural areas that are extremely underserved communities. And that especially impacts um, our uh, communities of color. Uh, and, and so, uh, you know, we'll, we'll iron out a whole lot of the inequities that we have in healthcare in California. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, and yeah, this is going to, like I said, I love calling this the health equity bill because that's exactly what it is. Um, and I'll keep in mind, you know, like I, I praise this bill. This bill is great. It is a starting point. Um, there are, we are going to have to build off of this bill. This is our foundation, our framework. This, you know, we haven't chose the color of the paint. We haven't chose our design scheme for the furniture yet. AB 1400 is the mere frame. So this is like, you know, going to build a, be the frame. So imagine how great uh, the house is going to look when we get it all built and furnished um, if AB 1400 is the frame. And that's what I like about it. But I still don't have a lot of the, you know, uh, the, we don't have it all worked out, but we're going to keep building here. Um, go ahead, just Dr. A, just one more quick thing. I, I mentioned COVID too, just to add to what I just said, was that the reason we've had so many deaths due to COVID, I mean, we are the world leaders in this country in COVID deaths. Why are we the world leader? It's because our priorities have gone for commercial market interest 
not for public needs interest. So let's undo that, at least in California, okay? Let's stop letting people die unnecessarily. Let's direct those resources where they're needed. Let's do universal testing and contact tracing. And, you know, in our inner cities, especially in rural communities, where they really need it the most right now and stop that uh, the, the inequities in those underserved communities. That's how we, we start to, to you know, uh, attain equity and parity with the other civilized countries of the known world and universe. We are not a civilized country um, compared to all those other advanced countries in the world, like uh, Bernie says, the major countries in the world. California is as big as we, as Gina pointed out, um, as most countries, I think it was Gina or was it Erica, uh, one the, of you said, we're, we're as big as, as Canada population wise, we're the fifth largest economy in the world. We can, we can have healthcare on par with, with any other advanced country in the world, just here in California. And, and you would see that most immediately in, in, putting a stop to these unnecessary COVID deaths right now. Exactly, exactly. Um, so I just wanna to go to Kyle's question really quick and then uh, Sylvester, I know you have your hand up. Thank you for being patient. Um, Kyle asked, why don't we hear about this on the mainstream news? Simply put, they haven't been told to talk about it. Um, I like what Maureen uh, Cruz, who is our lovely director of healthcare for all Los Angeles has brought up as something that I think we should put together, which is inviting some of our op-ed uh, writers um, like David Lazarus, people who have like written small op-eds about this um, in like the LA Times, inviting them for a panel because if you invite them, you invite their typically their organization. Um, and so that may be how we do this, but it is not something that is going to probably be um, heavily advertised. Um, even with the resolution supporting AB 1400 passing the Los Angeles City Council, which is big, big, big. And you didn't, I didn't see a blip about it. Um, I didn't see anything in LA Times, I, nothing. Um, and I think it is because that this is a people's bill. This is a bottom up bill. This is not a top down bill. Um, if, if the governor, for example, wanted this bill and was pushing for this heavy, um, then it probably would get a lot more media attention if Gavin would come out on this um, and be and be you know a voice of this. Then the media would come because he is at the top. But you know, L.A. Times doesn't know who Gina Harris is, unfortunately. Um, maybe they will soon, but they don't know. And so for me to bug them about putting this and running this on page one is a lot different than Gavin Newsom saying, hey, I have a bill that I want passed and it's going to revolutionize healthcare for California. Um, you know, so it's just, you know, unfortunately, the little guy's voice doesn't isn't sometimes as loud. But when all the little guys and gals and people and people doodles of the world come together, that school of fish gets really, really big. And then we come and we kind of can go after the sharks. So we're just slowly building our school. We're just gonna keep swimming for right now. Um, but it will, I'm, I'm anticipating as this heats up, it will come out. Um, you will see some type of media attention about it. I just hope it's good. Um, Sylvester, you had your hand up. Yes, and I know y'all can't be here all night. So I'll just kind of jumble everything into one. Um, one, I definitely wanna know how I can get more involved in support and uh, just you know help with everything that you all are doing, because I love it. Um, two, um, is there, uh, in terms of like, you know, again, different talking points that you use for people, is there is there an, another conversation that can also be used in terms of like letting people know like, hey, listen, on your paychecks, you'll have more coming back because you're not gonna have money that goes towards insurance. So that's gonna help out everything that's going on in the home. And then I know we kind of talked, you kind of touched a little bit on the federal level. Um, I'm a congressional candidate in the 38th district, and I'm, I'm wondering, is, is there a, a parallel between AB 1400 and what can happen on the federal level in terms of a model? Because I know you're talking about this being a framework for everything. So I'm just, if it's in the purview of all of this. Um, yeah, absolutely. So I'll work backwards on that. So um, 
yes, AB 1400 is a, not quite a mirror. In my opinion, it might be a little better than Medicare for All, which is uh, Jaya Paul's bill and, um, and Ro Khanna and Bernie Sanders and everyone's kind of rallying or behind that. They, there is a bill on the national level. It is not exactly AB 1400, but oh, what's the bill number? There's a bill that's in the house um, that is kind of uh, in purgatory. HR, HR 1976. 1970. Okay. Yeah. It's in purgatory, um, right now, unfortunately, um, in the house. So there is a bill, the national Medicare for all bill. Um, and then you, we have AB 1400. Um, there are conversations about which one should be take precedence, but we're, but we're here in California. I'm fighting for Californians. Um, but I also, of course, would be supportive of HR, you know, 1976 for the Medicare for All bill, but there is something at the national level as well. Um, but, you know, this is going to be a big fight. And person, my personal opinion is that it's going to be the fight is not as big in the Assembly and the Senate of California, even though that's still a lot that as it is in the Senate and the House of the United States Congress. So um, if we can get it done here, though. I think we would win over a lot more support on the national level um, because then they'll see it. And you know, right now, it nobody can see it, nobody can paint it out, nobody knows what it looks like. Um, but you know, if we get it done here, then they'll be able to see it, and I think we'll get a lot more support after that. Um, and then, how can you get involved? So, I mean, if you like uh, HCA LA, you know, we are a driving force on AB fourteen hundred. As you see, we're here um, doing office hours. Um, and so I think uh, if you want to sign up and give us your information, Paula, can you drop the link for the volunteer in the chat? Um, and, you know, you can get plugged in that way um, with us. And I think that we, like I said, are leading on this. Um, CNA is ramping up as well. Um, and we'll be doing events all over um, the, the state, um, including probably out there in your district as well. Right now, they're um, they have district leaders that are coming, you know, and this is assembly district, not congressional, I'm sorry, district leaders who are hosting, we're starting up text banking, um, text banking people about making them aware of AB 1400, how to get involved, how to contact your assembly people and get going that way. So there's going to be, there's a lot of stuff starting up that, you know, healthcare for all PNHP, we had kind of started a little early getting ahead of the game, starting to put this out there. Um, but right now, yeah, you can definitely get involved uh, that way. And of course, we love to have you and your voice, um, especially, and I'll just say, especially reaching into communities of color are going to be a big, big thing. Um, that is something that I am definitely going to be, you know, uh, focusing myself on. Um, so I would love to have you with me on that one. Um, and then, I'm sorry, there was one more in, the, in between. I got the beginning and I got the end. What was the middle one? <laughs> <laughs> yep, the other one was about, um, uh, oh, about the... Uh, more money coming in in terms of now you don't have to pay for insurance and while since, since we you know added something in because this is going to be my last question i'm done done but the other question i was kind of wondering i think because i think sometimes with the pushback it may come from the uh illusion of exclusivity when it comes to oh, I, I want my own insurance and things like that and we all know the different you know issues that can you know be born out of like i want something inclusive to myself whether Isn't or not it's that, i live in la well, i know yeah. all about exclusive. <laughs> right so there's so like yeah so the question to that is like are, are people you know if there's like a talking point that people are scared that um you know if we do this then that ucla uh, you know, a medical facility is going to be overrun because everyone's going to go to the nice one, you know, Absolutely. and how to push back against that. So it's that question. And then the paycheck question, are we going, you know, that's All something right. to use. And I like those two questions because I've addressed them directly before. Um, the paycheck question. So, you know, I added it up. I looked at my own check stub, right? And I was like, how much am I really paying out in healthcare? And I added it up. I was like, okay, based on like additionally, like maybe, you know, where I'm going, you know, I don't utilize my benefits aggressively. Like I don't have like catastrophic, catastrophic or chronic illnesses, catastrophic illnesses being like a major cancer or something like that. That's what they use. And that's how they use it in the insurance world or in the, in the care coordination world. But, um, I was like, okay, yeah, about 6% of my salary 
um, is going into healthcare. And that's just accounting for my, my deductibles, my premiums. Let's say I see my primary doctor a couple times a year, and then I have a medication copay I have to pay for every month. Um, you know, you account for, let's say one urgent care visit, like I said, I'm otherwise healthy. So I, I guesstimated about 6%. That's a rough guess, guesstimation of me just with my check stub and a calculator. Um, my background is not accounting. <laughs> if someone has a background in accounting, maybe we can hit that a little bit harder. But I just wanted to say that, yes, um, you're, you will get money back in your paycheck. That's why, you know, in the, the basic principles that I went over in the beginning, it will save the person thousands, save each an individual thousands, and then the, the actual industry billions. Um, and so, you know, but the counter to that, because I am one who thinks of any and everything you can come back to me with is that, well, didn't Gina, didn't you mention progressive taxation? I sure did. But I can guarantee you that the average person is not going to see 6% um, of their pay going straight to healthcare. Um, now, granted, like I said, we've got to build that out. But if, even if you did, if that guaranteed healthcare, because that's 6% and that's even, that's with gaps, that's with deductibles, that's with co-pays, that's with a lot of me still paying 6% plus all the out-of-pocket costs I still have to pay. And so if that is gone, it's kind of like, well, you know what? That actually isn't that bad, you know? Like just scratch my head, that actually doesn't sound bad. Um, so, you know, there's that part on that too. And then um, just coming back to, um, you know, what you were saying. Um, oh my God, my mind just blanked on me. I'm sorry. It's Sunday. Uh, How you get it, about exclusivity? You talking oh about yeah, the one? exclusivity. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So cow care covers a lot, but it's not going to cover the BBLs, the, uh, breast augmentation, unless it's medically necessary. It's not going to cover a lot of that cosmetic stuff that here in California, a lot of people like. Um, so where I personally, this is my personal opinion, see these insurance companies doing if this passes and says, okay, yeah, we're going forward is that they're going to create what buy-up plans, just like other countries, other countries who have universal or uh, single payer, they also have some type of private buy-up plan. It's almost the opposite. The public funded program is the majority. And then you have these small little privately funded things going on over there where you can get a little bit of buy-up, you can get some extra stuff. So maybe if you want to have a cosmetic buy-up plan, you might go ahead and go pay Anthem that extra whatever they're going to ask for for a cosmetic buy-up plan. If you want to be exclusive, then you can have your, your buy-up that gives you access to something that maybe CalCare doesn't cover, but there's so little that CalCare doesn't cover. And if a provider, for example, does, um, decides that he does not want to be part of cow care. He's, he does not believe in this. Let's say he's down in Orange County and he does not believe in single payer um, because Trump told him that it does not, it should not exist. I don't know. If he decides to opt out, he's out for two years. That means you get, if you cannot provide any service that cow care covers for two years, and let me tell you, it's cow care's comprehensive. And so he will be basically stuck doing Botox injections and stuff like that. If even if, if he's trained for it, you know, that's a certification in itself. Um, and I guarantee you after that two years has passed, he will be the first application in to get into the Cal Care Network. Um, but I do, I could see something along that line happening. Um, I, I could. Now regarding people flooding to the tertiary high considered high level hospitals like UCLA, Cedars, et cetera, Keck. Um, could you see more possibly? But let me ask you, are you gonna drive from Cerritos to Westwood when you don't feel good? I don't right. think you are. <laughs> I don't, I have to do that. The reason why I say that is because I have to go from Westwood to Cerritos to get my car at five o'clock on Wednesday afternoon. It took me almost two hours. So if I wasn't feeling good and I needed to get to a hospital, do you think I'm really going to go all the way to Westwood just because I know it looks pretty and they have all the commercials and all that stuff? No. Um, and then if, if we're funding and building up the hospitals, these smaller hospitals in that area, yeah you're probably gonna to go to your community hospital because you know what, now it's got that fresh coat of paint. It got that, those resources that they needed to make those cosmetic changes that everyone's in love with. Um, 
But I think that that it's for California, I don't see that happening. I don't see people coming 10, 20, 30 miles to go to one of the bigger hospital systems if they have a, a smaller hospital nearby, unless they needed it, unless they needed some type of high end thing, unless your surgeon was at one of these hospitals and you're going back to that surgeon. Um, I really I could not tolerate not feeling well sitting on the 405 for an hour just because I said I wanted to go to UCLA. But that's just that's just me. I mean, some people may. And like I said, the wait at UCLA, there's still a wait now. There's people waiting four, five, six hours in the ER down at UCLA today. So, you know, that is to say that, oh my God, there's gonna be hours and hours of wait. Yeah, there's hours and hours of wait with the current system right now. So we need those community hospitals. If anything, UCLA and the big system should be helping these smaller community hospitals because those weights equal bad reviews. And these hospitals, let me tell you, they care a lot about those reviews. <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry, I'm not going to go down that road, but I hope that answered that. And then um, I uh, do want to, uh, Dr. Bill, I saw you have your hand up and hey, Rich, are you working? The yellow mask just looks amazing and it's just so coordinated. Now, that's what he wears at home for fun, right? <laughs> Can't. It's, it's how I keep my baby clean. <laughs> <laughs> he's on diaper duty. He's dressed up for diaper duty. He's going in. Okay, all right, go ahead, Dr. Bell. Well, um, I, I'll be real quick because I want to give it over to give the floor over to Dr. Rich. Uh, clearly, his time is more valuable than mine. But, um, but I, I was just going to say two things. First of all, uh, there's, it, it, I think you're absolutely right, uh, Gina, um, the amazing Gina Harris, once again. Um, in other countries where they adopted single payer system, the, the, what, the better known you know, and larger, more reputable systems were not overwhelmed. People decide to go uh, based on other factors, uh, you know, convenience, um, word of mouth, you know, whatever it is. And, and the other thing is nobody wants to like be stuck, you know, on waiting lists and in lines forever and, you know, to go to some ivory tower and stuff. Um, they will go, they will use resources that are commonly available to them. And especially for, for things that, you know, don't require some super specialty type of uh, institution. So, uh, so it does work out. Um, the other thing I, I wanted to mention just uh, in response to uh, Sylvester's question about um, the federal uh, versus state efforts, um, there, there is a need for us to two gum walk at the same time, work on both state and federal at the same time. And uh, you're right, Gina, the federal bills are in some kind of purgatory which is not all that hard to figure out actually because they've been working on these budget reconciliation bills that had to do first with COVID recovery. Now they're, they're looking at trying to get past the, the blocks in the, in the U.S. Senate, which is why you know, Bernie hasn't reintroduced his Medicare for All bill yet, but that's going to come out soon. But once they get past those things, you know, then they're going to work more on getting uh, Jaya Paul's bill through the hearing process. Um, but right now, something really important is going on, and that's Medicare expansion, right? So they're trying to lower the eligibility age. They're trying to introduce uh, uh, prescription drug negotiation, which is, you know, part of CalCare, too, is being able to negotiate down uh, prescription drug prices. And then also to add important services like dental, vision, and hearing, which which actually was pointed out today in a town hall we had at uh, Progressive Democrats America, which you can find on our Facebook page. I dropped that in, in the chat. Just go to Progressive Democrats America um, Facebook page, but you can uh, see in our town hall we had the excellent um, Alex Lawson from Social Security Works uh, discuss these things. We are putting big insurance, big pharma, and big hospital on notice. We are challenging all three of those things by expanding Medicare right now in this reconciliation of budget process and through what Biden himself is calling his Build Back Better Act. So that is going on federally. It's actually going to help us at the state level as well, the past AB 1400 and vice versa. So 
I think, you know, um, it's important to look at both of those things, work on them both. Um, so I just wanted to throw that in. Thanks. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Bill. All right, Dr. Rich, what's up? Hey, yeah, I just want to say thank you to Sylvester for asking that question. It's a really good question. And it actually, it, it's, a, it's an example of one of the big problems of our healthcare system in that people ask that question, you know, isn't everyone just going to go to UCLA or Cedar sinai um, for their care? It, 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 it exemplifies the lack of equity um, with healthcare. And that's, that's a major problem. People shouldn't have to only be able to get good, quote unquote, good health care um, when you're in, you know, Beverly Hills or West LA, right? You, you should be able to get good health care wherever you live, whether it be you live in Culver City or whether you live in Lawndale or Hawthorne or Carson or all these other, you know, smaller communities. And so it, it's unjust that um, our quote unquote best tertiary centers are only in those areas. And that's what AB 1400 Cal Care will help fix is it will level the playing field so that we can get equitable care everywhere so that these smaller community hospitals will give you the same level of care that you can get um, in more affluent neighborhoods. Yes. Also, I wanna say, I love that it's an acronym BBL. I'm just saying, thank you. Yeah. BBLs are that is the thing because like like because cow care covers so much and is so comprehensive I had to think of something I'm like well what is it that cow care won't cover and I'm like a BBL a BBL Brazilian butt lift is not covered in cow care um unless it's medically necessary you can't appeal to that and I'm like well what would make a Brazilian butt lift medically necessary and I'm like, mm, maybe your butt got torn off by a bear. I don't know. You were on a hike. You came too close to the bear and it swiped the butt cheek off. I don't know. Um, but, you know, that is the reason why I keep bringing up Brazilian butt lift to everyone who, who is watching is because cow care is so comprehensive. I really did have to think really out there to see like, well, what is it that that cow care won't cover? Um, and I'm like, yeah, plastic surgery, elective plastic surgery, like I said, Breast augmentations are something that are done when you have, met, uh, have to have radical mastectomies due to breast cancer. Um, that is something that insurance co will cover right now. Um, so that's why I say if medically necessary, because there are cosmetic procedures that are medically necessary. Um, and like, and I use the breast cancer one is probably one of the most common. Um, and so unfortunately, because breast cancer is so common, but you know, I just, you know, wanted to put that out there. If it is medically necessary, then maybe you're doctor can appeal and and get that covered under cow care but i don't see when a brazilian butt lift could be considered medically necessary <laughs> i mean i don't know dr bill you're the er doc here so i mean i'm i'm going to assume that there is some incidents where someone has missed part of their their derriere uh and maybe needed that for symmetry I don't think you want to hear all of my ER stories at this point, but I would just emphasize, but, but, uh, but anyhow, um, you are absolutely correct. Once again, uh, the uh, uh, Jedi Gina has, uh, has um, correctly nailed this on the head. The most of plastic surgery, you know, will be covered because it falls under reconstructive. So anything that's reconstructive is actually covered um, under CalCare as essential medical services. So it's really only elective or you know what are called uh, cosmetic uh, procedures. And so yeah, if a company can you know an insurance company can go into business covering you know things that are not essential medical services, then then it sounds like they can do that. Um, but that's, it's so few things. That's the only example usually that people could bring up. Yeah. I mean, if you compile them, like I really do think about these things because I want to make sure we have counters for any opposition we're going to face. And I do think about these things and people want a lot of cosmetic dentistry, um, veneers, things like that. So cosmetic dentistry, cosmetic, you know, I'm like, so you could build something, you know, you could get together and work it. And I'm like, they pay people lots of money to do that. And I'm like, they could compile something and slap a sticker on it, a price sticker, and then let people buy it. Um, so I'm giving you guys that advice for free. 
because I want you to stay out of my way when this, I want the insurance industry to stay out of my way and let me do this. So I'm giving you your plans and your options for free right now, if you're watching, uh, so that you guys can stay out of my way and let me give healthcare for 40 plus million Californians. And you guys can have your little specialty package of whatever cosmetic thing you want to label it. Uh, Nancy, I saw you put your hand up. Um, one related and one going back. Um, I got to say, my dear aunt who had Kaiser insurance forever, she got a, a facelift because she had reduced visual field and uh, driving her home from the hospital. She said, wow, I never saw cars on both sides. And this was a lady who was driving, by the way. So I, I suddenly realized there, there's lots of ways to get plastic surgery with a medical indication. But I also want to go back a little bit. Um, I, I have worked in plenty of private hospitals and university hospitals and, and um, county hospitals. And I will testify that I really think that care in county hospitals are probably the best there is. You know, if you were in a car accident, you're going to do best with the people who have all the experience in the, in the county hospitals. I once had a woman who um, the nurses were saying, oh, this mom's mad at you. She wants to leave the hospital. And when I talked to her, she said, no one's giving me any, any um, respect here. And I finally said, you know, ma'am, I think you should go to the county hospital. You will get better care. You'll get no respect because they have no time for respect. They give good care. <laughs> anyway, I had to share that. No, you're absolutely right. I deal with this on a regular basis. Uh, people who are, well, they're not doing this or they're not doing that. They're not, uh, it's too cold here. I don't get enough rest. I'm like, you didn't come here to rest. You came here to get better. And that's what we're here to do. So yes, we're waking you up at four in the morning because I have to draw labs. Um, and those labs are due so that the team can review them at seven so that we can figure out what we're going to do with you and if you're stable to go home or not. And guess what? I'm going to poke you again at 12 and I'm going to poke <laughs> you again at six because that is what it takes to make you better. I was like, this is not a spa, despite no matter how much the hospitals want to look like one, this is not a spa. Um, but at the same time, unfortunately, this is not AB 1400 related, but I'm sure the docs on here can relate. Um, we have gotten too far on that patient satisfaction, H caps, things like that, where it's more about making the patient happy versus making them better. And for those of you who are not really in the industry, what we have seen, I want to say, I've been a nurse. This is my 10 year nurse anniversary. I realized that I've been a nurse 10 years now, um, which don't talk about me, Dr. Bill. I, I know I'm still young, but, um, but 10 years, actually, the healthcare industry, thanks to technology and everything, has actually exploded, accelerated. Like, just like light speed behind me right now in my background, the healthcare industry really hit light speed in this last time. We went to electronic EMRs. I actually, when I first started, was still documenting paper charting. So I was like the last gen to come in on the paper charting. And then we went completely uh, electronic. Um, and so we saw this, but then we also saw a shift and it being, while we're still very care focused, we're still about meeting um, our care and making sure we're providing good care and the patients are getting the care that they need. This other thing came in and started hitting really heavy, patient satisfaction. And you would think patient satisfaction should mean, okay, I got better, I went home, I'm satisfied. Well, we find, we're finding out patient satisfaction also means, well, my nurse took too long to bring me that blanket I wanted. And now I'm, I'm giving her a three because she took too long. Well, she was in a room with another patient who really needed her help and she couldn't bring that blanket right away, but be, you still rated her a three and the hospitals go insane about that. Well, what action plan can we put forth to make sure these threes become fours and fours become fives and, you know, and they pressure the nurses and the doctors like nobody's business about patient satisfaction. And I'm like, but those, and they make us kind of feel like we're not doing our job, but we are. Patients alive, patients well, patients got their meds on time. Okay, I did not bring that apple juice right when I was, they wanted me to and they had to hit that call light again. I'm so sorry about that. But you know, at the same time, it's like patient satisfaction, yes, is important. But now we're starting to put satisfaction with, you know, kind of like more of the cosmetic waiter style, you know, was I, did, was I warm? Were you this? Were you that? You know, did you feel like your doctor, um, 
addressed all your needs, which is like I said, I'm not saying it's not important. I'm just saying that we're being pressured in a different way again now with patient satisfaction versus care. They're separating those out. And I don't know why. And I think it's like now patient satisfaction is like now taking more precedence than the care, which is kind of weird in the industry right now. Anyway, but Dr. Bill, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, just, Gina. <laughs> so true. It is so true. And um and a reason that I don't miss it, uh, actually being in the environment that much, uh, uh, being retired and, and being able to look back at it. But I think um, that may have more to do from your perspective inside the fishbowl than outside the fishbowl. But, uh, uh, but two things I wanted to bring up were, uh, first of all, what is considered essential medical services? And you might think, do we have to, you know, invent all of that and actually we you know we probably don't i mean even your cosmetic dentistry you know a lot of that there there are systems already that cover a lot of dentistry right whether they're commercial or public so um and if it's evidence-based you know meaning scientific rationale for it then that might cover your implants or veneers or something like that that will ultimately give you better outcomes, you know, your, your life, um, um, you know, quality of life improve by having those things. And uh, again, we're the fifth largest economy in the world. Why can't we give people those things when they need it? Okay. So, and then the other thing I want to say um, uh, is that uh, uh, the, the discussion on what we're all comfortable with. Uh, some people are com more comfortable in the giant mega system, um, you know, like like the Mayo Clinic or UCLA or or you know um, something that has that kind of stellar reputation. Um, some people are more comfortable with the committed solo practitioner, you know, the doc on the corner kind of thing. Um, you know, we call that committed versus committee kind of thing. And, and that depends on your, your own level, your own predilection. And you should be able to decide that, not your employer, you know, not some network uh, that you signed up uh, through an insurance plan. You know, that's what single payer does. It allows you to find your comfort zone. And so you can end up in a, in a small practice group or a mega large practice group or something in between, you know, like Kaiser or something like that. So um, you can gravitate to that and feel like you're getting the right amount of care that way. And, and you know, that they have the right amount of uh, sympathy and, you know, and able to um, relate to your problem and get you what you need. Um, we don't have that now. That, that those decisions are out of our hands they're made in corporate boardrooms, and that we're talking about, you know, moving away from all that to where you actually have those choices. Exactly. Um, and I just, since we're talking about medical necessity and cow care, I just wanted to read um, a little bit from the actual bill. Uh, we, I feel like we haven't gone back and really referenced direct citations from the bill in a while um, because we've gotten to know it so well, but I just want to cite this is chapter four, the benefits. This is the, you know, this is the important part of the bill. What does it cover? But anyway, um, it says individuals enrolled uh, for benefits under cow care are entitled to have payment made by cow care to a participating provider emphasis on participating um, for the health care items and services in subdivision C, which is it lists all the benefits that cow care covers, if medically necessary or appropriate for the maintenance of health or for the prevention, diagnosis, treatment, or rehabilitation of a health care decision, or excuse me, condition, the determination of medical necessity or appropriateness shall be made by the member's treating physician. Ooh, not the insurance company, or by a healthcare professional who is treating that individual and is authorized to make that determination in accordance with the scope of practice, licensing, the program standards established in chapter six by, and by the board and other laws of the state. Um, meaning 
truthfully, as a nurse, um, I'm not allowed uh, to prescribe. I can't necessarily place orders without a physician. So I technically could not, you know, uh, write for you to have, uh, you know, things or services, right? But I could go to Dr. Bill and say, hey, you know what, they really need this. And then Dr. Bill would trust me. And he'd be like, you know what, you're probably right. Go ahead. Here's an order. Uh, that's how we, that's how we go. That's how I get down. Uh, but I'd be like, they really need it. And then if you tell me no, then I kind of throw a little temper tantrum and, you know, I still get what I want for the patient. That's what I do. Um, and so I just wanted to, you know, share that because we're talking about medical necessity and that is determined um, with the appropriateness by your physician. Right now, I'm fighting insurance companies having to literally go, and this, and this is another, I'll share this story really quick, and then we'll get to Randy's question here in the chat. An, an insurance company that I will not name literally denied a transfer to a lower level of care um, nursing home for a patient because they felt like because the patient had been in the hospital for a certain amount of time, they should have gotten the proper amount of therapy needed already. That is, that was what they said. So what we did, we escalated it and called for what we call a peer to peer situation where we have the attending physician. Um, and, and I don't know if Nancy, if you've had to do these with insurance companies at you, I, yeah, Danny. Uh, I, we asked the attending physician to call the medical director of the insurance company and they fight it out or well, not fight. They just kind of explain you, you know, a little bit better than maybe what's documented in the notes that they received. Um, and so, you know, then that usually ends that and they still make a determination. Now this was completely unnecessary because we're sending you to a lower level of care, which typically means it's not as expensive as staying in the hospital. The person gets more rehab because in the hospital setting, physical therapy is not able to do the amount of therapy that you would have in a rehabilitation center, okay? Physical therapy in the hospital, they get you up, they move you around, they do their preliminary evaluations, and then they give recommendations. They recommend whether you need equipment, do you need a, can you go home safely? That's their whole thing is doing those safety uh, uh, evaluations. Are you safe to go home on your feet with maybe just a walker? Can you go home without anything? Do you need support at home or do you need a rehab facility? And if they're saying you need a rehab facility, that's what I go off of. That's what the doctor goes off of. And that's what we start building your discharge around. But for, for some reason, this insurance company denied that, even though we had all of the justification. Yes, patient had been in the hospital for a while, but he was elderly. And the longer you stay in the hospital, the more debilitated you get. Um, and they, but they approved. The hospital stay, thousands and thousands of dollars a day, whereas a skilled nursing facility may be meh, a thousand or less a day. So what sense does that make? That goes back to the basic principle of eliminating bloat and waste because a, a medical director who had never seen this patient, who is only going off the notes, even after having a conversation with the attending physician, still said that this is not necessary. The patient, should, the patient does not need the rehab even though they've never laid eyes on the patient and they overrode the attending physician who is laying eyes on that patient every single day. Now, what sense does that make? And they just wasted thousands and thousands of dollars. They just paid out thousands. I mean, making it rain over here, thousands of dollars when we're just sitting here, like we're trying to help you out. Like, don't you care about saving the money? And so that's, that literally happened last week. Um, so anyway, I just, I digress. I, I want to get to the questions in the chat, but I really want, that is an emphasis. That is the epitome of example of bloat and waste. Um, and so I want to go to uh, Randy's question here in the chat. Um, AARP opposed because they get money from United Healthcare Insurance, which they do. Um, how do you convince seniors to support? And they are very conservative. Um, you know what? This actually is conservative. We are conserving money here. Just like I said, the example I just used is an example of waste and, and money being wasted. So if you're a true financial conservative, you would think that that should have made you like rich. Oh my God. We just wasted thousands of dollars letting this person sit in the hospital when they could have sent them to a rehab facility a week ago. Um, and so when you have that going on in the current system, that is, you know, and we could have saved that, that just That's lets you a prime example. This is what the insurance companies are doing, even though they won't tell the politicians that. 
they don't send their lobbyists to, to paint that picture. Oh, saying that, oh yeah, we, we blocked this um, and we wasted thousands of dollars. We're not gonna tell people that. Um, but at the same time, like, like I said, you know, this, this bill actually saves money in that administrative waste because the, the person who had to stay on the phone gets paid a lot of money an hour um, to do their, their job. And they just spent an hour, two hours just sitting on the phone waiting and waiting and waiting for the insurance company just for the insurance company to come back and deny for some stupid reason that is tons of money wasted that that case manager could have been seeing his other patients could have put been putting together the other discharge plans could have been doing a lot of other stuff but had to sit on the phone and wait and wait and wait with the insurance company and you guys just paid him 60 something dollars an hour to do it now that would make a conservative that should make you know you you tighten up a little bit if you're a financially fiscally conservative republican but for some reason, I feel like the conservatives are only conservative when they feel like it does it helps them directly and doesn't help the greater good of the world. Um, you know, I, I find that this argument with conservatives a little bit of a hypocrisy in a sense. Um, so, you know, that is how I would face that argument is that, you know, people are getting paid, are wasting hours and hours of, you know, time arguing with insurance companies, um, getting paid to do so. The insurance companies are sitting on the patients in the hospital, wasting more thousands of dollars, or they're not providing the care or authorizing the care that the patients need at the time that they need them. Now the patient has to utilize more of the healthcare system, wasting more thousands of dollars. Now we're probably equaling into the millions if you add it up across the state, if not billions. Um, so that's why, as Nancy says, it's cheaper. If you're a conservative, don't you want to save money? I mean, that's the whole point, right? It's cheaper. Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, Dr. Bill, you want to add to it? Yeah, I'll just throw in a word about, um, you know, uh, Medicare Advantage uh, is, is very much the same thing. So Medicare Advantage and these uh, supplementals to Medicare were added on <laughs> during the uh, George uh, W. Bush years um, by a Republican Congress to uh, skim off money of, of the public, uh, you know, uh, resources uh, into commercial health insurance companies, and that's known as Medicare Advantage. So they came up with all these plans, Senior Advantage, and you know, then AARP jumped in, and other companies jumped in because. What's, what are the deepest pockets that these corporate raiders can dip into? Public. The public pockets are always the deepest pockets. That's what the military industrial complex and military contractors are always trying to do. So they, they dip into the public resources for healthcare as well. Now, traditional Medicare runs at about 2% administrative costs, right? We've all heard this. Commercial insurance companies make between 20 and 30 percent they're skimming off the top. So with the introduction of these commercial health insurances into Medicare during the Bush years, now in Medicare Advantage, with companies like AARP and United Health jumping in, or even Kaiser Senior Advantage, they're skimming off the top to where traditional Medicare now costs something like 10 or 12 percent administrative cost instead of the two percent that traditional Medi Medicare costs. Now, if you were in business, you know the way people always say, oh, government should run more like a business. But if you were in a business, which business would you want to have, you know, with an overhead of two percent or 12 percent or 30 percent overhead? Okay. You would want the 2%. We're, we're all, it's our business. Medicare is our business. We should want it to have a 2% overhead, not a 12 or 30% overhead. We need to go back to what traditional Medicare was with no supplementals, no Medicare Advantage, no AARP dipping into the public resources for Medicare. And that's double, and a lot of them are doing a double dip, a, a loophole, a secret double dip. Um, they are using, and then they're coming to the government for additional uh, subsidies. Oh, well, you know, we're going to provide this really crappy Medi-Cal plan or Medicaid plan, but we want a tax break for it. 
So they're double, triple dipping. I mean, they're dipping each finger, basically each, each finger is being dipped into our little fun pool here. And, you know, and they're just sitting there like, mm, 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 that's delicious. Can I dip my other hand, please? Um, and everyone's like, yeah, sure. Why not? Oh yeah. You provided a foundation. Oh, you created this. Okay. Yeah. Here's another dip. And so it's just dip, dip, dip. And I'm like, Gina doesn't get to dip anything. Why don't I get to dip? I'm like, I help the patients. I'm like, why can't I dip anything? Um, and so, you know, if I can't dip, they can't dip. I'm just, I'm just putting it out there. If I'm not dipping, you're not dipping and that's it. Nobody dips in the pot. Okay. Um, but I just wanted to say too, when it comes to Medicare Advantage is that, um, you know, the, because of that overhead constantly on the increase, because we're running the country, we're running our public services like businesses, businesses are not there to serve people. Businesses are there to represent their board of directors and hit their, prop, their bottom line, which is profit. And that is the why public services should not be ran like a corporation, because corporations do not answer to their workers, nor do they answer to the people they only answer to the board of directors okay and so right now the board of directors of these insurance companies the board of directors of let's say the country are the only ones that have that are you know in charge here and where's the accountability if it's a circle of friends then who's holding the friend accountable um and so there's no accountability happening right now with our public services that's the problem that is the problem with part c and so and what part c is doing is saying but we're, we're lowering the premiums which they are part c is providing actually a lower premium than part a and b which is the original medicare why because they kept chipping away at the original medicare right? And then allow the insurance companies who have the budget to be able to provide a little bit lower premium uh, to, to just go and do that. Why? Because they, well, they're also getting subsidies. So if we just put that back into the original Medicare, those premiums aren't there. So you see what I'm see, saying? It's like, we have to stop this separation and we're being brainwashed to think it's a good thing. It's not. Um, all right, we're getting into our last 10 minutes. So I wanna go into Dylan's question. Is there a cap on the amount of dental work that can be done in a year under CalCare? That is a very good question. Um, that is one of the questions that I would say are adding, you know, when we're starting to, you know, put the draw, drywall and the paint in the house of the framework. That is not, I, there's not a limit, like in the bill in AB 1400, it does not provide a limit. It doesn't say that, for example, most insurance, dental insurance will tell you that you only have a certain amount of money for dentures, a certain amount of money for uh, like uh, braces and stuff like that. In CalCare, the current bill, it does not state, you know, a limit per se, but there probably will be, it has to meet necessity. That goes into cosmetic dentistry versus necessity. Now, if you need braces, you know, then cool, you should be able to get braces. But if you want veneers because you want to have the like perfectly straight teeth like they have in Hollywood, then that becomes, well, is that medically necessary? Um, but if your teeth got knocked out because you were changing, you know, the horseshoe on a horse and he kicked you in the head, uh, then yeah, you probably need to get the veneers or whatever, you, you know, uh, dentures put in. But um, so that is where, you know, it, giving an exact answer to that, Dylan, I can't say there is a limit, but I can guarantee there it will be kind of a necessity thing. But I will say this in the bill, still in chapter four, um, it does say that the board on a regular basis and at least annual will evaluate whether the benefits under CalCare should be expanded or adjusted to promote the health of the members in California residents, um, accounting for changes in medical practice, new information, research, et cetera. So um, if they start off um, with a certain, you know, kind of uh, build for dental, and they realize that dental needs to be expanded or something actually needs to be covered under dental that wasn't covered originally, they have the power, the board has the power to decide that. And that's the great thing about this is that it's not a, um, it's not just stuck there. It's not like stagnant. Once it passes, it can be expanded. It can grow. If there are services that aren't being utilized, um, maybe they don't have to cover as much, but a lot of times we can continue to grow this. We can continue to provide services because it's constantly being evaluated. This will be a living, breathing thing, just as much as the people that are covered in it are living and breathing. 
Um, so that, yeah, like I said, that unfortunately, I wish I had a direct, direct answer, but unfortunately that's why we need to get all the legislators to pass this bill so that we can answer those questions a little bit more directly. All right, anything else? Cool. Anything else in the chat, Paul? Nope. Amazing. Dr. Bill, you have anything you want to add, Nancy? We're about eight minutes shy of seven. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Thank you, guys. I always enjoy doing this. Once again, uh, well done, uh, well directed. Uh, um, office hours, Gina, thank you so much. And Paul, thanks uh, for hosting. Great job. Yes, thank you so much, Paul, for being my the tech slash chat guru. Um, from San and I just, Francisco. <laughs> oh, right, from San Francisco. He's not even at home right now. So thank you so much for taking the who, time to do this. Who knew? I know, who knew? Home of Gavin Newsom. And can I just add a chime in? I hope everybody has voted already or will vote uh, no on recall. Um, we do need to keep Gavin Newsom in office. Uh, everybody else on, you know, in that question two uh, part of the ballot. Thank you. Yes, you know, sharing her I voted paper um, it is horrible. Will mean a huge setback uh, for lots of issues, not just uh, healthcare. You know, but also on the education, women's rights, and especially climate. Oh my God! Uh, so we need to uh, stop the recall, and uh, so we can further advance uh, AB 1400. If you uh, can help out, um, you know, to a uh, phone bank or that kind of thing to stop the recall, um, you can do that through your county Democratic Central Committee or through the California Democratic Party. They can uh, get folks, uh, um, you know, in a phone bank or text bank or canvassing or get your yard signs, window signs, bumper stickers. Um, we just need Democrats to turn out like they uncharacteristically, you know, almost never do for midterms and special elections. We need them to turn out and, um, and make sure they turn in their no on, on the recall vote. Thanks. Thank you. And, that, and the recall election is September 14th. Yes. So if you have received your ballot, please drop it back in the mail. All you have to do is select no. And that is that. Um, the recall recalls are put in there as a fail safe. And right now, the Republicans right wing are using this fail safe against us by saying that we didn't get what we want, we can't win straight out, so we're going to pull this and use it for our advantage. Um, now, what would you recall someone over? I would recall a governor if he's just started talking about how slavery was a good idea. Guess what, now you're getting recalled. Now that is what I would recall someone over, okay? Um, recalling a governor because he kept the state locked down to keep us safe and wouldn't let you get your hair cut and wouldn't let you go golfing or eating inside that restaurant that you wanted to go to. That is not a reason to recall a governor that especially when they're up for reelection next year. Now, if you didn't like Gavin the way he was on his first term, then guess what? He, you can decide in 2022. But like I said, they're playing a very dangerous game here. This is not the time to play retribution. I don't care what you feel happened or what you feel about the governor right now. This is not the time. The time would be 2022 but not right now. This is a very dangerous game that's being played. And I am not, you know, I'm not even adding drama to that. This is downright dangerous. Um, and so I just want to emphasize to that. I am not a fan of what's been going on. I really would hate that this is even taking up my life, but I really want to emphasize the importance of voting and turning in that ballot. We are blessed here in California that we have gotten mail-in ballots. Other states we're not allowed to do this because they have Republican and conservative leadership who want them going to the polls only and then shut down half the polls in the state. So right now, if you have that ballot and you have not turned it back in, I am imploring you to do it. 
drop it in the mailbox. That's all you've got to do. Select no. It's a very simple ballot. Don't pay attention to the 45 names on there. Don't look them up. Just select no. That's all you have to do. Because if no wins, then that ends that, okay? But if yes wins, then that becomes a problem. So oh, no. that's why we want no. You just no. no bubble, no. And go. Oh, no, no and go. go. No and go. Drop oh, it in no the mailbox. And go. Oh, and sign it. Please sign it. Uh, please sign it the way that you signed your voter registration card because that's how ballots get thrown out every election. So please sign that envelope and then, you know, you vote no, you sign, you go, okay? Vote, sign, go. <laughs> All right, with that being said, I'm gonna give everyone back a three minutes of their lives. I wanna thank you once again for joining in with CalCare Office Hours with uh, Healthcare for All Los Angeles, PNHP, and we hope to see you again next week. Bye, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, everyone. You guys take care. Stay healthy. You too, stay healthy. Mask, mask.